I'm gonna help my eyes not to see no colors of tell my ears not to take no lovers or keep my hands underneath her. I'm gonna keep my eyes on you. I don't need no other. Welcome to God is Open. I am your host, Christopher Fisher. On today's episode, we're gonna be responding to this guy. What's his name? Ethan Welch, and he's of the Bridge Church by request. By request, we're going to be reviewing his sermon, God is All-Knowing. So uh, that's something we take interest in in this program, right? So that's probably something good to review. Now, I have not watched this, so we are going in blind. I watched about 20 minutes of his uh, sermon on sovereignty or something like that, but uh, not this. We're, we're about three and a half minutes in, so I have watched three and a half minutes. It's all introduction. It's all personal stories. But here on God is Open, we don't like connecting to our audience. We just like cold, hard logic and true. I don't know. But uh, he seems like a personal guy. I see, he seems a little, a little fake in the in the way he dresses. He's no Mike Winger, but he's trying. So you got to give him a little bit of credit. But Ethan, tell us, tell us about your sermon. Let's let's figure this out. Mm, uh, thing about about me. And the interesting thing about you as well is that all of us, hopefully, all of us as human beings, part of our humanity is that we are learners. I like, I like this framing that he just put out there that human beings, part of humanity is learning. He, he's going he's gonna to deny this to God, isn't he? That's what he's going to do. But God is a person in the Bible, and a person who has emotions, has a, internal internal conflicts, internal struggles, who, who learns and experiences and grows. There's a character arc. There's character development of Yahweh in the Bible. Yahweh, God, he creates man in his image. People who want to claim that God is the eternally simple outside of time and and uh, you know timeless and has this ungenerated knowledge of all all future events in what way in what way are we made in the image of god so when he, if he's trying to use this as a as a framing device to say god is totally different than us this is not the framing device that the bible uses to talk about god god is a person god has emotions god has feelings you can hurt god in the bible god is a person so he says Fundamentally, part of humanity is learning. I would agree. That part of humanity is part of God. We are made in the image of God. But go ahead, Ethan. Tell us all about this. All right. To be a learner means that there is information out there that you do not yet have. And you are in a constant process of gaining information out there in order to learn and to make yourself more educated. Is everybody with me here? Here's what we're going to look about, uh, look at about God today in our series called All. Today we're looking at God, God as all knowing, and God has never been in a position in which he learned anything. So this is his frame. He's setting up his sermon and he's he's prompting the audience. A, a good speech will prompt the audience to to show him your thesis, show what the subsequent evidence is going to prove. But it also frames the discussion. So what's going to happen is he's going to turn to verses about omniscience and uh, then claim, just claim just by quoting these verses, it means what he just said, that God cannot acquire new information. There, there's God has all propositions eternally in his head, and God cannot gain a new proposition. Is this the framing device that we see in the Bible with respect to God's omniscience? God is the all-knowing God. Spoiler alert, it's not. The Bible doesn't frame God's knowledge in this way. Instead, the framing of God's knowledge in the Bible is God is in heaven, like the psalm says, and he watches the ways of the earth. Psalms has multiple references to that. Hebrews, even Hebrews, uh, New Testament, after a lot of Hellenization is going on, God is still in heaven watching the deeds on earth. God acquires through sight. God acquires through senses. In the Bible, God tests to know. I was talking to a Arminian the other day, and uh, I said, uh, yeah, he God tests to know, and he says, no, the Bible doesn't say that. So then I turned to a passage, and it literally says that, I test you to know, literally the phrase, and he hemmed and hawed, and I uh, said, oh, that doesn't mean what it says. Okay, so the Bible can literally say the mechanism for God's knowledge. It can literally say the words, 
but you're going to reject those words. You're going to have to give me some sort of solid reason why the text doesn't mean what the text actually says. And just, just assuming, assuming it's not in the Bible that God watches to learn or tests to learn, assuming it's not in there is begging the question. And, and it's uh, overriding, overriding the grain, the stream of the text that we find throughout the Bible about God's omniscience. The atheists in Israel say, God does not see. The counter argument is God does see. So it's it's not this timeless propositional truth. You don't see this framing in the Bible. So notice the philosophy framing that he is setting up. He wants his philosophy to be true, and he's going to turn to proof texts. God has never been educated. God never needed information. There has never been information that was out there that God did not already have. So those, there's a lot of claims there. There's a verse in Isaiah that he might turn to with God's never been educated. But in context, in Isaiah, what this is about, it's about no one's going to lead God around by the nose. God is sovereign. God is king. God does what he wants. And some kings are weak kings. And they have advisors who who like kind of trick them into doing their things. And they, they're, they're like crafty. And they, they get the king to do their will. Although the king's the one enacting it, quote unquote. But uh, that that's the point in Isaiah. God is powerful. God is sovereign. There's no one leading him around. It's not like he's learning all this information from advisors. But what that's not about is gaining propositional knowledge. It's not saying that someone doesn't communicate something of substance to God. Remember back to the Sodom 18 scenario. Not only does God go go uh, check out the reports that have come to him. So those reports are giving him, gaining him knowledge, but his actions in investigating the situation on the scene, that's also gaining him knowledge. It's it's propositional knowledge being gained to God. So there, there's going to be some conflation as we see already in, in what he's saying. He's he probably just going to ignore these counter texts. He's probably going to stick to his proof texts in order to try to prove his philosophy. Again, the Bible does not frame God's omniscience in this way. There's nothing in the Bible about not gaining new propositional knowledge, which shows you, shows you the disconnect between this guy's value system and the value system of the writers of the Bible. And what we're going to look at today is when we look at God and see who he is and recognize who he is, it produces all in our lives. And part of the premise of our series of what we're doing this summer is I don't think that we think about God often enough. I really don't think that we stop to think about who he is and what he's like and what he can do and what he has done and the power that he has and the wisdom that he has and the knowledge that he has and the love that he has. And so we're, we're taking uh, some time over the course of the summer to just look at God, look at his attributes, look at who he is and what he's like. And I believe that when we look at God and when we see him for who he is, then it produces all, A-W-E, all in our lives and I think fundamentally changes us from the inside out. Now, I do like his uh, physical gestures, uh, how he talks with his hands, how his whole body illustrates the point that he's talking about. He seems to be an adept public speaker, and for that, I can credit him. Uh, that the whole thing that we heard was just, it wasn't like evidence for anything. It was kind of practical advice uh, coupled with maybe an emotional call to action, and uh, at, he it's almost like an emotional call to believe the things that he's going to say. He says, oh, think about how great this is going to be in your life. Now let me tell you about these things. And he's he's prepped you, he's framed you for accepting this on an emotional level because of how it's going to affect your life. So it, it for public speaking, probably a good thing to do. But if you're wrong, if you're wrong, probably not a good thing to do. Out. We're going to look at one particular person today, a guy by the name of Apostle, the Apostle Paul, who was a theologian and church planner and pastor and apostle, and what he, after seeing God and knowing God, the way that he responded to him. Yeah, so that's interesting that Paul writes that God receives information from the Spirit who searches man. Right. If we don't know what to pray about, Paul writes, the spirit searches us and then uh, advocates to God on our behalf. The, the spirit communicates information, propositional knowledge to God. God learns, according to Paul. So I don't know where he's going to go with the Paul stuff. We'll see. This is what he says in Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 33. This is how he responds. He says this. 
Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. He's using metaphorical language to talk about like a well, like an endless well, a bottomless well. When Paul thinks about the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, oh, the depths of that wisdom and knowledge. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Now, me, like yourself, or like, what in the world does inscrutable mean? Inscrutable uh, means impossible to understand, like scrutinize. You don't have the ability to uh, scrutinize and to know and to understand God's ways, His knowledge, His judgments, His wisdom, the things that God knows. It is just completely unsearchable. Now, here... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause right there. So th- there are some things that we see going on. I don't, I don't think anyone's going to disagree with Paul's claims about God but but how we take them is a different matter. So we 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 don't we don't want to go to an English word and read a definition and then assume it's a hard and fast definition and then apply it back to Paul. So if I'm talking about women and I say uh, women are mysterious and no one can understand women what we what we understand is uh you know generally women kind of do things maybe irrationally or or th- way, things that we don't think add up, right? So there, women might be beyond searching out, maybe be being impossible to understand. Uh, that sort of language can be applied to ladies, right? So that'd be general generalities or hyperbole or just normal, normal uh, absolute talk about a subject that's vast. So, so turning to a specific definition and then thinking that that definition is the one true definition that Paul is using. Maybe that uh, if, if God's judgments are unsearchable, that means unfathomable. At, it might be a mistake. It might be a mistake to just assume that Paul is meaning that nothing God does at all in any extent can be understood in any regards. Instead, it seems to me more like Paul might be making a praise claim that God, God is intelligent, God is smart, God has access to all our information, we or all the information that we don't have access to. So his his judgments are a lot more clear, a lot more accurate than ours. That we just don't have access to that same information. Uh, there's there's no need in this verse to make it absolutist language and and. Uh, take it too far we we always have to be careful not to overextend words we think back to the times in the bible where the prince of tears said to know all secrets king david is said to know all things on earth believers are said to know all things to understand all things luke luke has a perfect knowledge from the first uh the the jews in the case of paul had foreknowledge from the beginning you know, sometimes this language is out there. We we want to be careful when we're using language. So we're just not assuming, assuming meaning onto it. And we allow it its normal latitude of use in order to decipher the text. So what is the thrust of what Paul's saying? And probably don't don't try to impose absolutist language on this. Here's what's interesting about Romans chapter 11 and where the Apostle Paul finds himself. If you want a doozy of a Bible study this afternoon, take your Bible, open it to the book of Romans, and begin at chapter 1 and walk through as many chapters as you can. By about chapter 3, your mind will already be blown. You'll be trying to put together and keep all the thoughts that he is saying just in order. By the time you get to chapter 9, you're like, ah, wow, I don't know what is going on. Chapter 9 is a doozy. It's a doozy. And then chapter it almost sell, sounds like he's trying to sell us something. So if uh, you know someone has a very complicated car and they say, "Well, look, this car is uh, super complicated. I took the manual back, and you know it's just impossible to understand. This is the latest technology. It's, it's great." And I, that sounds what he's doing here—that he's trying to sell us something. Um, I, I don't know if he knows that's what he's doing. 10 and then chapter 11 and Paul after explaining to this Roman church which is why it's called the book of Romans explaining to this church who God is and what he's like and everything that he's done Paul gets to the end of chapter 11 he's just like oh the depths of the wisdom and the knowledge of God like how unsearchable are his ways and how inscrutable his judgments or inscrutable his ways he's just he's just like out of words he's like at a place where he's like God is 
amazing. Yeah, one of the things about Paul in Romans is he's trying to convince a hostile audience of uh, Gentile equality in a Jewish-centric religion, right? The Jews thought they were special chosen people uh, without without equal. Like the Gentiles, they, they could be God-fearers, but unless they fully converted to Judaism, they weren't on equal plane. And so Paul spends the entire book of Romans trying to convince a hostile audience that Gentiles have equal standing in the body of Christ, in Christianity. And then he ends with this. It might it might be more of a statement to try to convince Paul's listeners uh, that God acts in mysterious ways rather than to just as a general claim that everything God does ever is mysterious. Maybe, maybe just, just throwing out that throwing that out there. Oh like wow oh my goodness look at God and Paul, like I would say, understood God probably more than I do and had an understanding of God and heard from God and knew God even in a more personal way than I would say even myself that I, I do. And Paul, after knowing God and experiencing Him, he's just completely left in a place of awe. I'll say it, I'll say it this way. Um, one of the ways you know you've really experienced God is you're left in a place of awe. One of the ways you know that you've really experienced God is you're left in a place of, of awe. You're, you're blown away. Your, your mind is just completely blown. This, this seems to be more emotional selling. Is I, I, don't, I can't tell if this is uh, fake humility. Like, oh man, learning these things just blew my mind. It's, it's, maybe he's like a... What's the guy who stands behind the hype guy? So he, he's hyping up his own product that he's selling. He's hyping up his sermon with these statements like, oh, my mind is blown. It's just devastating. And he's, he seems to have spent quite a lot of time on this. I don't know if this is a characteristic of this guy's sermons. Probably it is. I'm guessing if I watched a lot more of his sermons, he, he'd be doing this hype game quite often within his sermons. Um. I think of passages like Isaiah 40, verse 28, where Isaiah the prophet, he says, Have you not heard? Have you, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. So it's interesting that that chapter ends with God saying that mankind will be granted this uh, not getting wearied, right? And so the language being used is, it's it's not... It would be a mistake to try to take it in some sort of metaphysical absolute sense. Uh, understanding in that verse, of course, is God's craftiness, God's cleverness. In the ancient world, not only did you have to have knowledge, but in order for that to be practical, you had to have the ability to use that knowledge to do things. In context of Isaiah, it's all about God doing things. I've planned it. I've said it. I will bring it to pass. Look for power acts. Look for God in, in Isaiah 40 through roughly 48, the first half of Deuter Isaiah. Look for power acts. What God says he's going to do, it's all about. You'll be highlighting almost everything. This is all about God's power to accomplish, God's craftiness, God's cleverness, God's practicality, his usefulness of information. In that text, in that text, wayward Israel doesn't think God is watching. The answer is God is watching and God will punish you for your sins. Like you can never get to the end of the mind of God. You can never actually find out everything that God knows. It's just unsearchable. It's so yeah, so he's he wants... He wants this theology to be true, so he comes across a word in the Bible that he thinks meets his philosophy. He throws it in a sermon, and he expounds on that word, assuming assuming that's what the original writer meant as well. So this is, it's kind of sloppy. Words, of course, don't have absolute definitive meanings. They, they're they loose and flexible. There's a lot of hyperbole and generalization. And it's a, very much a mistake. If if the context doesn't warrant what you're claiming about the verse, if, if it doesn't make sense, who's talking to who, what point are they making? If that phrase, if that statement was taken to mean the thing you're saying, would it still make sense in context? If it doesn't fit the context, you know, you're 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 reading into a verse rather than letting the verse read for itself. Again, it's God's craftiness and it's infinite. And that infinite language is used for the amount of grain that was collected by Joseph, which 
which everyone, everyone could understand that that's hyperbole. Joseph did not collect an infinite amount of grain. He collected a finite amount, some finite amount, but there's so much grain that's uncountable. Often in the Bible, God is incomparable. So in Isaiah, the other gods do not compare to God. There are, is no other God besides me. That, that's language of comparability. There's no one who is my equal. There are other gods. They're all lesser beings. They don't have power. They can't stand up against me. They would fail in a contest, as we see in Isaiah. The lesser gods are nothing. God's comparability is what is at stake. It's like a cave that you can never get to the bottom of. It's like a well that is completely bottomless and there's no end to it. A he, he wants this word to be a metaphysical absolute. The context maybe, maybe might warrant it, but probably not. I love the way that the psalmist says it in Psalm 147 verse 5. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding, it's beyond measure. You don't even have a scale big enough to measure God's knowledge. Create a scale and it won't be big enough. Double it and it still won't be big enough. Triple it and it still won't be big enough. So one of the problems with modern people reading the Bible is they come across value claims, uh, claims by individuals in the Bible about God, and they'll, they'll turn them into metaphysics. And so that, that was not the mindset of the ancient Semite. The ancient Semite, as we read in Isaiah, uh, God's not powerful just because that's an attribute of Godhead and God must have that attribute. And, and you go look at this verse and it says, look, God has all power. That must mean he can do all things except for things that are logically contradicting or things that violate his character. No, that's that's not the Semitic mindset. They look and say, oh, God, they, he created the world. Okay, check mark. Uh, he led us out of Israel. Check mark. Uh, he said he's going to send us into Babylonia in exile, and then he did it. Check mark. So you add up all these things, and you can make a subjective evaluation of it. God can do things. God, God's powerful. No one's going to thwart God. So what he takes as metaphysical claims about God are really subjective evaluations by the author of who God is. God's not good because it's his nature and character in the Bible. God is good because he does good things. Th this, is this is really an understressed point in biblical theology that when we come across claims about God, what those are are summations of evidence that people have pieced together and putting a general label on that. They are characterizing God rather than making metaphysical absolute claims that must fit all scenarios, right? God, God is all-knowing, but in Genesis 18, there's something he doesn't know, right? In Genesis 18, he has to go to Sodom to verify the reports which have come to, come to him to see if what was said to him is true. This doesn't negate all those times that where it says that God is watching us and seeing all our sins. What, what does that mean? Does that mean absolute knowledge of all molecules on, on all planets and in the entire universe? Maybe, maybe, but does that mean that God can never withdraw presence and choose not to see something, that it's a metaphysical absolute? It's a formula that must be true or else God isn't God. This is not the Semitic mindset. When we're coming across these descriptions of God, God can be who he wants to be. This is implicit in the name Yahweh, I will be who I will be. God's not going to be defined by your formulas. And he wants to turn... All these statements, he's going to turn to statements throughout the Bible, verses throughout the Bible, and turn them into formulas rather than general character descriptions being ascribed by individual writers. Infinitely, uh, exponentially increase it, and the scale will still not be big enough to measure God and his knowledge. See, I feel like one of the ways that you really know that you've experienced God is that you're le you've le been left in, you're in a position of just awe before Him. And let me put all my cards on the table for you this morning. I think that for, for me and for you, one of my fears, being in the South, in the Bible Belt, in the culture in which we find ourselves is I believe that a lot of us have close proximity to the things of God without actually ever knowing God himself. Um, just to be completely candid in the process of praying. He, he's selling it again. You, you see him, he, he's selling us something and this is his emotional appeal to us to believe what he's selling. 
right? It, uh, he, he might be right. He might be wrong. That's regardless. It's a, it's a salesmanship tactic that we're seeing going on here. And looking and searching and asking God to send uh, me and my wife to a place to start a new church. We knew that God had called us. We knew that God was going to send us somewhere to start a church. And I had um, West Coast envy. I was praying for Southern California, you know, because the it's it's unchurched and this and that. And I was genuinely asking that God would send me far away and send me to a place that was unreached and this and that. And I had a list of things for God that I wanted to do. And then God's like Wilmington. Wilmington, you know, right down the street from where you grew up in the South, um, which I love this city, but this wasn't like my idea or my design for which I had drawn up for my life. And I believe the one of the he's connected to the audience. He, he's uh, if you're if you do the color thing, you do the personality test. That's all colors. He seems like a very emotional guy or what they would call a blue. He, he, he does seem very emotional. He thinks with his heart, I would say, rather than his head. That's not an insult. Uh, that's okay to think with your heart rather than your head. But but it's it's kind of painful for me who who uh, I don't know who I don't very much care for people's feelings too much. I should I I should don't get me wrong I should, uh, but it, it makes a painful listen to a sermon. The reasons that God has uh, put me in a place like this is to awaken the hearts of people who are close to God or maybe even religious or spiritual and awaken the hearts to, uh, to know God and to experience Him. Um, I, um, I personally grew up in, in church. I kind of grew up doing the deal, going through the motions. I was at church like 47 times a week, you know, every time the doors were open i was i was there and um i i found that i was pretty good at uh doing what was necessary and checking the boxes and making sure that my parents were happy with me and making sure that the youth pastor and the other people and i think we're gonna fast forward until we get to your i'm gonna have to sit and watch it but you guys get to fast forward a treat for you fast forward to more substance rather than personal anecdotal stories which is not not as interesting as his substance all right, I think we're back on track. I think we're, we're back to the Bible. Don't prove me wrong, Ethan. All right, Ethan, please, uh, on track. It was. Thank you. And so here's what I want to do. Based on verse 33, I want to give you three quick points um, of the knowledge of God and the way that I think we should think about the knowledge of God and understand the knowledge of God. And I think that it will blow your socks off if you can stay with me for the next eight minutes. Okay? The knowledge of God. Here's number one. The knowledge of God is distinct in its quality. Qualitatively speaking, the knowledge of God is absolutely distinct and different and unique, unlike anything else in the history of the universe. His knowledge is distinct in its quality. What I mean by that is God's knowledge is perfect. Unlike your knowledge and my knowledge, God's knowledge is already in a state of perfection. So yeah, this is this is what I was afraid of. A lot of times, pastors they they know no actual classical theology more so than their audience does. Most most church practitioners, people who go to church, are probably open theists, probably think like open theists, probably envision God on along the lines of open theism. But the pastors they hold to classical attributes. So he's talking about a qualitative difference between. The knowledge that we have and the knowledge that God has. You'll, you'll hear this distinction made in people like Dolezal. Uh, he'll talk about this qualitative difference. There, there's a Calvinist that we reviewed quite early in our, in our uh, podcast where, where he talks about this qualitative difference as well. God's knowledge. It's not like us. He doesn't have just more facts in his head. He doesn't have access to all true propositions it's qualitatively different than ours our knowledge is gained by, by perception our knowledge is discursive meaning we think about things well well i'm i feel a little bit thirsty okay now so i probably should go to the refrigerator and probably grab a coke so one thing leads to another this is discursive knowledge god doesn't have that type of knowledge according to classical theism god's god's knowledge is of all true propositions and all things that ever exists, eternally ungenerated knowledge. It's not discursive. It's not one thing leads to another. God doesn't think things for certain reasons. It's not, that's, that's discursive thought. 
It's it's pure simplicity. You got to equate God's knowledge with simplicity. God's knowledge is static and qualitatively different than ours, which is not the framing of the Bible in which God knows all things. God sees all things. God tests to know. God is a person. God has experiences. God, God, his actions, behaviors, and thoughts are guided and predicated on his current emotion at those particular times. God is a person. But this theology, this classical theology, has to depersonalize God. God is not like us, they say. God doesn't have qualities that we have. To do so would to be to lessen God. But remember, remember, Norman Geisler made, a, made an entire book that said creating God in the image of man against open theism. But what exactly does that mean, that mankind is made in the image of God? In some respect, we resemble God. And we see that throughout the Bible. I, I, myself, personally, I'm quite a fan of Yahweh, his temperament, uh, how he handles situations. Uh, it resonates quite dearly to me. That's that's probably how I would handle things, too. Uh, different times that he's angry or sad or or frustrated, you could feel the frustration in the text. You could you could see God's thought process and you know, what God's experiencing. You you can you can sympathize and empathize with God in the Bible, but he's going to be denying that. He's going to be separating God from us. It's not a biblical frame. It's a philosophical frame. The, the Bible doesn't talk like this. The God, Bible doesn't present God in these terms. This is all his philosophy that he really likes. God's knowledge has always been and always always will be complete and perfect. It will be whole. God's knowledge has never been a work in progress. It has always been whole. Qualitatively speaking, the knowledge of God is perfect in which not one aspect has ever been needy. Jo Just watch the framing. It's a philosophical framing. It's not a biblical framing. So he has to turn to these proof texts, these these couple word sentences, and assume that's it means his theology. He you don't get you don't get like you get in systematic the theologies where it talks about God's knowledge and it, it expounds on it in these terms. It says, oh, this is what omniscience means and here's the attributes of it. Here's what it means and here's what it doesn't mean. You do not find that in the Bible because the Bible, categorically speaking, does not even consider these descriptions of these attributes as as part of their theological framework. It's, it's not an option for Israel to think of God in these terms. These are categories that are created centuries later. They do not think of God in, oh, God's knowledge is non-discursive. God's knowledge is ungenerated and uh, qualitatively different than ours. You're not going to find that in the Bible. And the language, all you have to do is read the Bible, see any interaction God has with the world. These are interactions. God is interacting with the world, which is discursive. Job 37 verse 16 would say, says this, God would ask Job, do you know the balancing of the clouds? So like pretty amazing. Like how God's interacting. So God gains experiential knowledge, right? It's, it's when, when we, when we live in real life, you know, you can experience something and that experience is going to change you. Uh, there's going to be a time before you had that experience and there's going to be a time after you had an experience and you're gaining some sort of situational knowledge that uh, you you can't eternally have it. Uh, it's it's individual specific. You're not going to be able to identically replicate this type of experiential knowledge in any situation ever. It's going to be uh, unique to the individual, to the situation. And when God's interacting with Job here, uh, talking back and forth, what is this portraying? Is it portraying this timeless God with a who's qualitatively different than us in such a respect that he he doesn't he doesn't process information like us? This this is a discursive conversation. This is a back and forth. This is a give and take. This is discursive. The entire Bible is written in this way that does not assume these philosophical attributes. And so the claim is the claim is by people like this that underline the text oh yeah the text really never talks about that uh but have you seen my proof text here in isaiah that means the entire bible everywhere everyone thought about god in these terms it just underlies the text although the text doesn't really ever talk about it that's that's not a proper way to read the bible it's not 
it shouldn't be convincing to anyone who has any integrity for the Bible, any canonical critics, for example, people who just care about ancient religions and they just want to know what those ancient religions believed. That should not be a convincing argument to anyone except for the people who are all already predicated uh, they they already want to believe this. Those are the only people this this type of uh, argument that's that that's going to convince because the Bible is not written with these categories as an option. It's just not. Are they like balanced in the air? God's like Job. Do you know the balancing of the clouds? The wondrous works of Him who is perfect in knowledge. Like God's knowledge, it's in a current state of perfection. The old. Who's talking? <laughs> who's talking uh do, oh, who are they talking to what's the context is this is someone is this someone that god uh, likes or criticizes for bad theology so uh, a lot of people they don't know the context of their proof text and so they'll just quote whoever is talking and assume it's bible endorsed theology and and it's safe to assume that even if it's job's friends and job's friends are criticized and god wants to kill him uh we assume that this section at least is a positive reference that could be generally endorsed by anyone that that's fine to do but then the question comes in on top of that in what way well, what sense are we talking about the one perfect of knowledge is is it like luke who has perfect knowledge of all things from the beginning right is that the perfection we're talking about or you you can't just assume assume your categories onto the text when luke has perfect knowledge from the beginning does that mean omniscience is that what you're arguing here or or are you special pleading? You're saying, you know, this phrase, when it applies to God, uh, obviously it means my theology. When it's about Luke, I'll read over the text without thinking twice because it's so obviously not a reference to my theology that it's not even going to register in my brain that it's the exact same language used about God. That's what they do. It's complete double standards. It's complete special pleading. They don't think about the proof text that they're quoting. If the proof text actually argue their theology they they're just happy they're just happy to find any phrase that might maybe maybe if you look at this one word have something to do with their theology because the bible's just devoid of all philosophy all of this philosophy that they're trying to impose theologian commentator that oh, um read this week, he, he says this, his name is Louis uh, Burkhoff, he says this, the knowledge of God may be defined as that perfection of God, whereby he in an entirely unique manner knows himself in all things possible and actual in one eternal and simple uh, and most simple act. Right, that's that's Platonism, that's, that's not Christianity. That's Neoplatonism, where God is a perfectly simple being without parts, without discursion, because discursion causes parts. God can't even be a trinity in this theology. In Augustine's On the Trinity, he has to turn Jesus into kind of like a puppet creature, you know? Like there's a dove descending, and there's a creature in time that says, this is my beloved beloved son because god really can't talk and so all these time actions this talking to job this this talking to john the baptist all of it has to be eternally predestined creatures in time uh, just echoing a divine will right and so jesus is that puppet creature because god is eternally simple outside of time he's ineffable he's categorically different than people and so uh, uh, great if that want if you want that to be your theology go for it but it's not biblical theology these are not biblical categories you will not find them in the bible and so you, you you really you really see this illustrated in the proof text that they use that their proof texts don't mean their theology that there's other and better explanations of their proof text and their double standard reading the same phrases that they use for god reading those same standards when those proof text language when they're used of human beings they're they are special pleading it's all special pleading and you know what it shouldn't be convincing it shouldn't be convincing to any neutral third party observer uh the true believers uh go for it if that's your thing i'm not gonna i am gonna fault you i'm gonna look down on you uh that is true i will uh but don't don't expect me to take you seriously it's god's knowledge his knowledge is already perfect and complete. He does not have the ability to increase his knowledge because it is already in a state of perfection and wholeness in which it has been from eternity past. 
The knowledge of God, it's distinct in um, its quality. As well, number two, the knowledge of God is distinct in its nature. The very nature of God's knowledge is unique and different than you, yours and mine. Um, God's knowledge, you could say, is, theologians would say, it's immediate and it is innate. God's knowledge, it comes from within himself rather than from without theologians say this right well yeah i I guess you're going to find theologians who make these claims they're just not biblical claims though Uh, what they'll often do the proof text that he's reading they'll throw out these these horribly specific claims about uh ungenerated eternal knowledge and then they'll do the shoddy proof texting that we've already seen where they're just quoting a random verse because uh there's some word and and uh we could take this word for theology therefore suddenly this is our Proof text. Regardless of context, regardless if God's actually changing or learning in the context, regardless whether in Isaiah God's emotions are driving how long he waits, uh, how long he suffers, uh, how he acts in anger, how God's emotions are driving his behavior in Malachi, God's calling, God, in, in their proof text for God being unable to change, God changes. He calls people to repent. The end. The end of Malachi 3 ends with God writing a divine book such that the people can be assured when God returns to earth, he's not going to accidentally punish the wrong people. The righteous people did all this stuff. God's going to return to earth and then accidentally kill them uh, because, you know, he is sometimes collateral da- damage happens. Maybe he's not unsure who the people are. This divine book is going to assure them God's not going to accidentally do that because their theology of God is a lot different than our friend Ethan's. Ethan has an entirely different perspective on Yahweh than the writers of the Bible. They they, they didn't hold to this stuff, this ungenerated knowledge, this uh, divine simplicity, this qualitative difference. You're not going to find it in the Bible. Out himself. For you and me, in order for us to learn things and to know things, we have to learn things outside of ourselves, gain the facts and the information of those things, and then bring them into our own minds so that we have greater knowledge of those things. God's knowledge is completely different in the sense of He doesn't rely on external information to have knowledge. He already has every bit of knowledge that He needs innately inside Himself without anything outside of Himself. Well, let's just see if that's true. We find ourselves in Genesis 18 and 1820 says, Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So in the Semitic mind, we see this throughout uh, the Bible, this divine council scene where God is in heaven, surrounded by angels. There's interactions going on. We see that in Daniel and in Isaiah, when Isaiah is brought up to God. We see it in Job 1 and 2. We see it in 1 Kings 22, a divine council scene in which God is hearing the information from the various angels. Remember in Job 1, the sons of God appear before God and then they give reports. Where has the Satan been? I've been going to and fro upon the earth. In Zechariah, there's seven eyes on the earth, which are angels, which are which go to and fro upon the earth. They, they cover the world and they report back to Yahweh different information, different details. There's even this idea in the ancient Semitic mind that our prayers are communicated to God via this intermediator, via angels often. So the outcry comes to God. And then God in Genesis 18, he goes down to verify that the rumors which have come to them, if they are true or not. If not, I will know. So this is a great verse because people don't know how to respond. Even ancient uh, Jewish commentators on this text really struggled with figuring out what this means because they want to maintain present knowledge of all things and so they can't have a god trying to verify events in the past right and so but but the text it's it's hard to get around this text what it actually says the outcry has come to him this is discursive knowledge this is this is knowledge from outside of himself knowledge through hearing through reports secondhand knowledge not internal eternal knowledge that's ungenerated and non-discursive and and uh all things, right? It's not exhaustive knowledge being being uh, described here. This is information that God is acquiring. And then he acts on this information to, again, acquire more information about this situation 
which is in the past. He's acquiring information about the past through going down and seeing the individuals. In my experience, it's hard for these people to argue against this text. Uh, they might, they could, they could argue that they're, he's going to go test to see if they continue in the same way, but that's still acquiring knowledge. That's still testing to know. This is still, God doesn't know all things internally, eternally, from all time eternal. Uh, nothing like that is going on in this verse. God is going to acquire information. This is acquiring information. This fundamentally violates what he's putting down here. We're going to have to, it's getting really late for me. I'm getting pretty tired. So we're going to have to cut off here, but I will be coming back to his his, his little sermon here. We'll, we'll see what else he says because he's actually teaching the classical theistic concepts. So he's a lot better than a lot of pastors who are teaching on omniscience who don't even know the classical position. And then they, they use their proof texts, but they, they don't, they're not quite there where they understand fully what classical theism actually says. This guy actually seems seems to know the classical theist position. Again, it's not a biblical position. Uh, the biblical authors do not frame God's knowledge in this way. It's a complete in, in position, in position. He's imposing on the text stuff that is not in the text, things that are explicitly denied in the text. Back to our, my Arminian friend I was arguing with, God tests to know. The language of the Bible says God tests to know. You, you just don't override that with a uh, claim to philosophy, with, with appealing to a Louis Burkhoff, appealing to a systematic theology, a systematic theology nowhere described in the Bible. Anyways, thanks for listening. Comments, questions, put that down below. Or start a thread on the, the Facebook group. Uh, the God is Open Facebook group. That, that's the one you probably, I, I probably won't see it otherwise. So, so start a thread there and uh, that'll be good. Thanks for listening.